Neurosurgery was officially recognised as a specialty in the 20th century. During a time of rapid technological development and scientific growth, neurosurgery flourished and remains one of the most exciting fields in medicine today. The discovery of complex imaging played a critical role in advancing our understanding of neuroscience. Every day we rely on various imaging modalities to guide our clinical practice and help make the best decisions for our patients. In this video, we'll cover a few of the key imaging tools and explain how they contribute to the world of neurosurgery. Let's start from the very beginning. If you were a surgeon living at the end of the 19th century, your surgical decisions would have been guided and influenced by what a patient told you and what your clinical examination found. When the nervous system is affected by something like a tumour, Patients often exhibit what we call neurological signs, such as loss of vision, loss of sensation, or even muscle weakness. However, in 1895, a German physicist by the name of Wilhelm Röntgen revolutionized modern medicine with the discovery of X-rays. Working with cathode ray tubes in his laboratory, he noticed a fluorescent glow of crystals on a table near his tube. When shielding the tube with heavy black paper, the fluorescent glow could still be seen a few feet away from the object. Wilhelm was able to reproduce this effect on most substances and presented a radiograph of a box containing weights to his colleagues. During one of his experiments, Wilhelm produced the famous image of his wife Bertha's hand. Almost immediately, he achieved extraordinary status amongst his peers, and scientists all over the world were excited by new prospects in biophysics. The well-known use of cathodes made radiographs easily reproducible. Within six months, X-rays were being used on the battlefield to locate bullets in wounds. Unfortunately, the tubing used to produce X-rays couldn't withstand the high voltages necessary for industrial use. So, beyond medical applications, the widespread use of X-rays was not not achieved until 1913. Inventor William Coolidge, with his thermionic Coolidge tube, was responsible for overcoming this hurdle. These tubes created a vacuum, generating up to 100,000 volts, allowing intense and reliable X-ray production for industrial use. As radiography became more integrated with medical practice, it became the gold standard for clinical examination. With the ability to provide objective proof, X-rays were vital in the fight against one of the great scourges of the era, pulmonary tuberculosis. But what of neurosurgery? Neurosurgeons, being on the cutting edge of science, experimented with this new technology to identify brain tumours and other internal abnormalities. Indeed, some success came in 1918, where an American neurosurgeons Walter Dandy and George Hewer published a series of 100 patients with brain tumours, 45 of whom showed radiographic abnormalities. However, the numbers do tell you that there was clearly another limitation. X-rays required a patient to lay still for several minutes and did not perform well in detecting soft tissue problems or tumours, for example. In fact, of those 45 documented by Dandy and Hewer, it's speculated that some of the abnormalities that were actually seen could have been things such as hair braids, for example. Today, X-rays aren't used for reviewing soft tissues. Instead, they're there and they're better identifying those dense materials like foreign bodies or bony pathologies. In other cases, we can use x-rays on specific areas to monitor or check the healing process in the spine, for example. We can even use them to look at things that we've implanted like ventriculoperitoneal shunts, and we can check the valve settings with an x-ray of the skull. That being said, spine radiographs do remain a critical part of the neurosurgical arsenal. We can use them intraoperatively to see where screws have been fixed, for example, and to make sure that we're operating on the correct level. Ventriculography and pneumoencephalography. Due to the limitations of x-ray, many attempts were made to obtain better images. One way to do this was to improve the contrast between the background, the tissues, and the bone 
with substances that block the pathway of the x-rays. This causes the surrounding tissues to light up like a bulb. For this purpose, heavy metals like bismuth, lead and barium salts were initially used to perform angiograms and cadavers, but of course this then spread to use in living people. Based on the same principle, Walter Dandy, one of the founding fathers of our specialty, noticed that air could be used as a contrast agent. When a patient came in with a penetrating head injury, the ventricles within the brain that normally have fluid within them showed that they were replaced with air on exposure and contrasted significantly with the surrounding soft tissue. In 1990, pneumoencephalography was developed, a technique that involved draining some cerebrospinal fluid from the ventricles and the subarachnoid space in exchange for air. While better imaging of intracranial structures was achieved compared to x-ray, the removal of CSF was a risky and unsafe procedure. Patients suffered from headaches, vomiting, developed meningitis and even died. In fact, some neurosurgeons reported that the mortality from pneumoencephalography was as high as 30%. Other methods didn't fare much better. Air myelography that was described in 1921 used iodine. When doctors noticed that some iodine-containing syphilis medications could make the urine radio-opaque, they had the idea to inject this material into the subarachnoid space. An alternative method called lumbar discography was introduced in 1948, and that was to look at degenerative disc disease. In this case, the injection was directly administered into the lumbar intervertebral discs. These procedures caused significant side effects, causing trauma to these structures, and local inflammatory problems. The methods were refined and then more favourable contrast agents were substituted in their place, but they eventually fell out of use altogether and have since been replaced by MRI and CT scans. But bones and soft tissues aren't the only things in the body. What about the imaging of the blood vessels? In 1927, Portuguese neurologist Egal Moniz set out to visualise the brain's blood vessels. He injected sodium iodine directly into the carotid artery, the major arteries in the neck that run up and supply your brain. That's the pulse that you can feel when people are checking you in the movies. Usually done really badly. This successfully illuminated blood vessels on the radiographs, but it was risky business. The carotid artery is nestled in and amongst loads of vital structures. It was only until a decade later that safer approaches to vertebral angiography were achieved. Incremental improvements eventually allowed for rapid serial imaging, and new technology permitted doctors to remove unwanted shadows that were created by the skull and focus in on the blood vessels alone. Later on, cerebral angiography played a crucial role in the development of cerebrovascular surgery and interventional neuroradiology. Angiography though commonly caused complications, such as difficulty swallowing and even death because of thrombosis, which is a clot that can stop blood flow to the brain. Historically, angiography of the entire cerebral vasculature required a general anaesthetic and a lengthy hospital stay. Nowadays, the procedure is much shorter and safer, and the anaesthetic is generally not necessary. Everything in the body has a blood supply, including the spine, and the first time spinal angiography was used was 40 years after cerebral angiography was made possible. Today, it remains the preferred method above both CT and MRI for diagnosing and guiding the treatment of spinal blood vessel problems. And that brings us to something a bit more familiar, CT or computer tomography. The first patient to be examined using CT was a female with a suspected brain tumour in London in 1972. British electrical engineer Geoffrey Hounsfield and South African physicist Alan Cormack shared a Nobel Prize in 1979 for their work on the development of CT. Initially, due to limitations in the design, CT scans were only able to image the head. Following advancements, other areas of the body were included, and improvements like lower X-ray radiation doses, shorter scanning times and computing times improved the image quality. CT scans are performed and processed using the same principles as when it was first created. Initially, a mathematical matrix of absorption values creates a number picture of the brain, 
which is later interpreted into a pixelated image on a computer screen. Over time, we've improved the number of cross-sectional images that a CT scan can take. And so the resolution and the diagnostic capability has improved massively. Where once upon a time, it would have taken about a week to process just one image, now a CT scan can be performed and viewed within seconds. CT scans involve lots of x-rays, but if you want to know more about how it works, we've done a short video in this on our channel and we've written an article on it too. MRI represented the next important step in neuroimaging. It relies on the spin of hydrogen atoms in the body and how they react to the magnetic field produced by the machine. The first MRI scan was done in 1973, one year after the machine was invented. Compared with CT, MRI has much higher contrast resolution and has the ability to take images in multiple planes. This opens up many new methods to analyse brain structures, especially through computer-generated 3D remodelling. In the 1980s, a new contrast agent, gadolinium, allowed for the better detection of lesions or tumours that were difficult to visualise on CT, such as vestibular schwannomas, for example, or even other types of brain tumours. For spinal neurosurgery, CT provided really good bony detail over standard x-rays, but MRI beautifully illuminates the spinal cord and the nerve roots in a way that cannot be achieved with other modalities. Early clinical MRIs were extremely difficult to do and time consuming. Even today, they can be quite challenging for unwell patients that just cannot lie there for long periods of time. And it may be contraindicated or not allowed in patients with older metal implants because the strong magnet can sometimes affect them. Nonetheless, MRI is an invaluable tool and it's excellent for looking at soft tissues. This was a brief overview of some of the most important developments in neuroimaging of the 20th century. If you're interested in more videos like this, please like and subscribe to our channel and let us know what you think in the comments below. See you next time.